Today we'll be talking about rates of change and some more function behaviors and different ways to analyze functions. Now rates of change, you may have experienced rates of change in some other classes, but you experience and talk about rates of change every day in your lives. Like when you're talking about speed, how fast are you driving? Miles per hour, that kind of stuff. That's all rate of change. So let's talk about a runner, Yolanda. She left her house at 6 a.m. for her daily run. She ran at a steady pace and it took her 20 minutes to complete two miles. She stopped and took a five minute break. Then she turned around and headed back home, making it back in 15 minutes. So let's analyze this situation a little bit more of this runner, Yolanda. So first let's sketch her run. And there might be different ways of thinking about how to sketch her run. Let's keep a, a consistent way of sketching the run by talking about what is the input or what is the independent and what is the output, what is the dependent. So talking about the two different quantities we have, well, we're talking about minutes, so we have time, and we're also talking about miles, so we have distance. So time and distance are the two options here for the inputs and the outputs. Now we want to think about which one depends on the other or which one is affected by the other. If you think about it, the amount of distance she has ran depends on the time that has passed. Time is almost always the independent variable. Whenever you have time, you want to use it as the independent variable. 98, 99% of the time. So the independent variable, the input, input T is time. But what kind of time? What is the time actually measuring? Are we using the time of the day, 6 a.m., or are we using how long she's been running? I think it would be easier and consistent to use the time since she's been running. So let's say time since start. Now domain, let's think about how long she was running for. So she started off the first leg or the first part was 20 minutes. She took a five minute break and then got back home in 15 minutes. So the domain for time, that's you know what is the starting time and what is the ending time? Well, since it's the time since start, the starting time is zero. And then the ending time, we want to think about how long was she running? How long is this story going on for? Well, 20 plus 5 plus 15. Put that in your calculator, do that in your head. That should be 40 minutes. So she's going from 0 minutes to 40 minutes. And we actually include these values, these times, in the function. So we put brackets on those. And the dependent variable we just said, that's the amount of miles that she's traveled. Um, so let's say distance traveled. And then the range for that, now the total distance traveled, so let's talk about that or think about it. She ran for 20 minutes and completed two miles. She stopped and then ran straight back. So assuming she ran the same distance back, well, she ran two miles out and then two miles in, call it an out and in or out and back. So that means that she ran four total miles. So the range for the miles or the distance is, well, zero miles at the start all the way up to four miles at the end. So now that we have the domain and the range, let's graph this out. So we're starting at zero and zero here and going along the x-axis or the t-axis in this case, we have minutes or time and then the vertical, the dependent is distance. So now let's label them. Well, the distance goes from zero to four. Uh, so let's just count by one. And in fact, there's a lot of lines here. So let's skip a line each time. So we're technically counting by one half. So one, skip a line, two, three, four. We don't need it, but let's just say five. And then the minutes, that goes all the way up to 40. So it should work out if we count by twos. So let's say two, four, six. And I'm just gonna start skipping lines here. Uh, so two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. 
16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, and all the way up to 42. So now let's plot the points for the different instances that we know in her run. So we know at the very beginning, zero minutes happened, so then zero distance has been traveled. So that's the very beginning. So we have a point at zero, zero. The next point we have is after 20 minutes, she completed two miles. So we have a point of the minutes being 20 and the miles being two. So we plot that point right here. We'll connect the dots later. And then she stopped and took a five minute break. So five minute break, well, we counted by twos, so we're gonna have to go in between lines. So to get five minutes, we go up two, four, and then halfway is five. So we have now, this is a five minute time period. And she traveled no miles, she just rested. So it was flat here, there's no increase in the mileage. And then next, she headed back home and it took her 15 minutes. So she traveled two more miles. So in total, that's four miles and that's 15 minutes. So right now, this point is at, if we count 24, 25, this point is at 25. So then we want it to end plus 15, that's at 40. So 40 is right here in between the 38 and the 42. So we have a point 40 and four. So now we can connect the dots. So we have this first leg, the rest, and then the last leg. So this is what her run graphed out looks like. Where if we label the endpoints of each leg on the graph, we have here, this is the point, if we look at the X, that's 20, and then the height is two. This point here is 25 and two. And then the last point here is 40 and four. And we can also label the starting point zero, zero. Now this idea of slope, you may have heard before and we're given this formula for it where you, ha you have the slope is, what we say the change in Y divided by the change in X. And this is something we really take for granted. But what it's really doing is you're finding how much did you change in the height or in the y value, and then compare that to how much you change in the x value. But in this case, the height is distance in miles, and the horizontal distance is time. So we're comparing how much someone has traveled in distance over time. So we're really finding what is their speed. And we can see what the units are in the speed after we do some of these calculations. But let's just take a look and find these slopes of each of these legs. So the first leg, the order pairs are from zero, zero to 22. And then to find the slope. Now this is not a big secret, but it doesn't matter which one you label X1, Y1, X2, Y2, you're gonna get the same thing in the end. But just for ease, let's say this is X1, Y1, X2, Y2, and then the slope here is the change in the Y's, so two minus zero divided by 20 minus zero. And let's keep in mind the units here. So the Y's, the units is miles, and the X, the units are minutes. So we do two minus zero, that's two, divided by 20 minus zero, that's 20. So this is two over 20, but we can reduce that to one over 10. So this is one mile per 10 minutes. So in sort of running world, you would say she runs a 10 minute mile. We could also say it in terms of a more consistent way is saying, if you do this division, you get 0.1, but you're really getting 0.1 miles per minute, right? Normally we think of speed as miles per hour,
but it's kind of hard to, to do that when you know, you're going kind of slow with running. So you could also say miles per minute, or if you want, you can expand this out and say miles per hour, but we'll just leave it at miles per minute. Now for the second leg, that's where she was resting. So we have the ordered pairs start at 22, 20 minutes for two miles. And then the next point is 25 to. So let's find what the slope is here. So we have M is equal to the change in the Y's. We can label these X1, Y1, X2, Y2. So that's two minus two divided by 25 minus 20. And in the numerator we have miles again, denominator we have minutes. When we do this, we get zero miles per five minutes. Well, zero divided by anything is just zero. So she has no speed or her speed is zero miles per minute. Because she was just resting, she wasn't traveling at all. So there is no positive speed that she has. And then for the third leg, we can scroll up to see those points. We have 25 and two is the first point. And then the second point is 40 and four. So label that X1, Y1, X2, Y2. And then the slope, do the change in the Y's divided by the change in the X's. So four minus two over 40 minus 25. And let's keep in mind this is miles and minutes. So in the end, we get two miles per 15 minutes. And we can reduce that in different ways. We could say that is one mile per 7.5 minutes, which is a pretty quick mile. Or we could say it is I'm going to use approximately because we'd have to round if we did this division, say 0 0.133 miles per minute. So I've been kind of already alluding to this when talking about the slopes and keeping in mind the units. But when we find the slope for her run, that tells us Yolanda's speed. In terms of miles per minute. So we can talk about what that looks like visually on the graph. So for the first leg and the second leg and the third leg, for the first one, she's running a 10 minute mile, which means she's running slower than she was on the last leg, where then she's running a seven and a half minute mile. So if we look up on the graph, well, this first leg is not as steep as the last leg. If you look, this last leg is a lot st more steep than the first one. So that's because she traveled less distance over the same amount of time. And then the middle leg, well, that's just flat, horizontal, because she didn't travel any distance. So you could write what you want here. I'm going to just summarize and say the steepness, if that's a word, put it in quotes, the steepness of the graph. So we can say larger slopes mean steeper. So we can connect slope with behavior of graphs. And when you say behavior, that's talking about increasing, decreasing, and constant. So a function is considered increasing over an interval of its domain, so it's x values when the graph rises from left to right or when it goes up. And that means its slope is positive. On the other side, a function is considered decreasing over at its domain, some x values, when the graph lowers or goes down from left to right. So we, when we're talking about increasing, decreasing, and constant, we always look at the graph from left to right. And its slope at 
those points when it's or when it's decreasing is negative. And then when a function's constant, that means it's just flat, horizontal. On its domain, then we say that the graph is horizontal from left to right, and its slope is zero. So in between negative and positive. So using that table that we just filled out, that box that we just filled out up above, I suggest pausing here and looking at the different points on this graph and determining, okay, is this point, is the graph increasing or decreasing or constant? What would the slope be here if it's increasing or decreasing? So pause right here and try to work that out for each of these points. So now that you tried that out, let's look at the behavior of each of these points first and then we'll say what the signs are. So the behavior of the point or the x value a, this graph, if you look around the x value a, the graph is going down, it's decreasing. So let's say decrease. And so that means the sign of the slope is negative. We'll actually skip B right now and we'll go to C. We'll do every other one. So looking at C, if you look around the graph at the X value C, the graph is going up from left to right. We always read it left to right, just like a book. So from C, it's increasing. So that means that the sign of the slope is positive. And then skip D, we'll look at E. At E, if you read left to right, the graph is going down, it's decreasing, so the sign of the slope is negative, the behavior is a decrease. We'll skip F and then at G, the graph again, reading left to right is increasing, so the sign of the slope is positive. Now the reason why I looked at every other X value is because the B, the D, the, and the F are what you can call in, in between points. They're not exactly increasing nor are they decreasing at these points. Right? If you look at B, it's to the left it's decreasing, but then to the right it's increasing. If you look at D, it's vice versa. To the left it's increasing, to the right it's decreasing. And so we would actually say these points are constant. They have a slope of zero because they're neither increasing nor decreasing at this point. It's kind of like when you're on a roller coaster, you're going up, you're going up, you're going up, and then when you get to the top, you kind of pause for a second, and then you go back down. So that in-between point, that pause, you're not going up or down at all. So the sign of the slope for these are all zero for those in-between points. And we would say the behavior is constant. So looking at some of these questions here, what is special about the point x equals b, and how does it relate to the behavior on either side? Well, the behavior on either side is doing different things. On one side, you're decreasing. On one side, you're increasing. And so it's kind of this transition point. And we also see this behavior at x equals d, x equals f. And at x equals d, it's different. If you look at, you know, at b, d, and f, B, it's sort of at the bottom of a valley here. Same thing with F, it's at the bottom of a valley. But on D, it's at the top of a hill or the top of a mountain. So you can say that X equals D is at the top of a hill. I'm sure you could say that in other ways. That's probably not the most mathematical way, but it makes sense to me. So this brings us to what we call extrema. And extrema are maximum or minimum values on a graph or on a function. However, it's not just the biggest function. However, it's just not just the biggest point on a graph or on a function. It's also, we can talk about local extremum, a local max or a local minimum. And that is a point that is the biggest relative to all the points around it. And then there's also absolute or global maximums and minimums. So let's look at each of the points from the graph above. At x equals b, 
if we look at this, it is what we would call a local minimum or a relative minimum. Because if you look around B, it is the lowest point out of all the points around it. It's at the bottom of a valley. To the left, all the points are bigger, and to the right, all the points are bigger. But it's not the biggest point on the graph. If we draw a straight horizontal line, there are multiple points that are below B here. So at this point where B is, we would say it's a relative or a local minimum, but not an absolute or global minimum. So let's say it is a local minimum. Now at D, we said D is a little bit different than the others. D is at the top of a hill. So D, if you look to the left of D, and if you look to the right of D, it is the biggest point out of all the points around it. So D is what we would say a local maximum. However, if you look at D again, it is definitely not the biggest point on the graph. It's not a global maximum because there are many points. These, this graph actually goes up forever. That's what the arrows indicate. So it's only a local max, not a global max. And then at F, now let's look at that one. We have F is right here. And same thing as B, it is a local minimum because it is the lowest point out of all the points around it. To the left, it's all the points are bigger. To the right, all the points are bigger. But it's also the lowest point on this graph. It's lower than B, it's lower than anything around it. So it is both a local and a global minimum. So let's talk about local mins and maxes on different functions or on different graphs. So let's take a look at this first one. We have this graph here. We don't really know what the equation is of it. We just have the picture. So let's talk about the extrema. And what you're really looking for is where there are changes in increasing or decreasing, or at the tops of hills or at the bottom of valleys. So here, this is where I see a bottom of a valley. Here, this is at the top of a hill, and then right here is at the bottom of a valley. Now let's talk about if they are local, global, maximum, minimums. So at, so let me make bullet points, at x equals one, it is a, now let's think about this, it's a minimum relative to the points around it. So it's a local minimum because everything around it is bigger. It's at the bottom of a valley, but it's also a global minimum because it is the smallest point or is the lowest point out of all the points on the graph. So at x equals one, that is both a local and global. And it's gonna be a minimum. I'm gonna abbreviate and just say min. And then for the next one at three, if we look at three, it is at the top of a hill. So it is a local maximum, but it is definitely not the maximum point of the graph. There are many other points bigger than this point at three. So let's say at x equals three, it is only a local max. And then the next one at x equals four, it is only a local min. Now let's talk about increasing, decreasing, or what we say the behavior of the graph. So for the behavior of the graph, I think it's easiest to just look at the graph from left to right. What is the graph doing? Is it increasing, decreasing, or constant? So from left to right, this graph actually goes left because it has the arrow, it goes left to inf negative infinity. So let's just say it has the same behavior and we follow the graph along here. And if we see what is the graph doing as we go left to right, our marker, our pencil would be going down. So that means the graph is decreasing. And it's decreasing all the way up until we get to the point one. 
So the way I would describe this is just go left to right. It's decreasing here. Okay, put that in the decreasing category. So from negative infinity to all the way up to one. And for intervals of increasing, decreasing, two things. We always use x values. So let's make a note. Always x values and always use parentheses. Never use brackets. And that's because for increasing and decreasing, you can't be increasing or decreasing at a specific point, right? Because like we talked about before, at one here, it's in between increasing and decreasing. So at one, it's technically a constant point. So that's why we can't say at one it's increasing, so we don't include it. At one, we can't say it's decreasing, so we don't include it. So we use the parentheses rather than the brackets. So this is one of the decreasing intervals. Now let's see what is the graph doing after one. So after one, if we follow the graph along here, it's going up, it's increasing. So let's say what this interval is that is increasing. It's going from one to three. So that's all we have to say. We only use the x values. That is one of the most common mistakes to make when writing intervals of increasing or decreasing is to use y values only x values from one to three. And then the next part we see from three all the way to what is it doing? It looks like it's going down, it's decreasing all the way to four. So it's decreasing here. So this is going from three to four is that interval using only the x values. And then finally from four all the way to well infinity, it's going to be going up forever, it's increasing. So this interval is four to five. Now one thing I want to mention when putting these increasing decreasing intervals in um, the homework system, it will usually ask you, so I'll make some space here, to use what's called the union symbol. So that's this symbol here. It's a big U. And whenever you're putting answers into the homework system, this will be an option in the math keyboard. And so when you are putting in multiple intervals of increasing and decreasing, use this union symbol. What it's doing is it, it's creating a, a union, literally, with these two intervals. It's connecting them together. So now for this graph here, this is measuring temperature in Fahrenheit. Now looking at the graph, you could probably guess where this is. Um, most likely Bullhead City, but maybe in Phoenix or some other warmer part of Arizona. And we can talk about the extrema here, but if you look at this graph for a moment, you might see that it's a little funky. There's a lot of jaggedness to this graph here. You can see it's going up and down and cutting around a lot because the temperature changes a lot throughout the day. Little tiny variations in the temperature. So we could probably say what the global max and min are, but it would be very difficult to say what the local max and min are because it's so jagged and it's always going up or down. There's tons of what I said, tops of hills or bottom of valleys. So let's take a look and just describe what the global minimum, global maximum are. So if you look, the global minimum is right about here. We don't know exactly what that value is. Maybe it's a seven, 7.5. So let's just go with seven. So the extremum x equals, let's say seven, is global min. And then up at around 16, that is the global max. So x equals 16 is global max. Now for the decreasing intervals, it's really hard to see or to tell because this graph is so jagged. But if we were to kind of make a big generalization and smooth over this graph, you can see a general pattern in decreasing to increasing. Even though it, there's probably a lot of little tiny increases and decreases throughout the day, we can talk about the general pattern here. So the decreasing intervals, I already kind of 
painted it out. The decreasing interval is from zero to, we're gonna say that's seven. Union, the other decreasing interval is from 16 to 24. Remember, only x values. And then the increasing intervals, well, there's just one of them from seven to 16. I mean, if you think about it, that makes sense for the temperatures of a day. You know, this is zero o'clock or midnight all the way up to 7 a.m. or around the sunrise. So it's the temperature is going down. And then once the sun comes up, it starts going up. And then around 16, this is 24 hour system. So this would be 4 p.m. The sun starts going down and the temperature starts decreasing. And then you cycle back to where you started. And that's all that we have for this lesson.